Good evening, Wednesday, April 29th. Thank you for being with us for another Washington Walks webinar Wednesdays, DC in the Movies series selection. This week, we're talking about advise and consent, Otto Preminger's film from 1962, based on a Pulitzer Prize winning novel and also a play. So this material has inspired a lot of directors and actors to do some really fine work. Um, I'm joined tonight, I'm Carolyn Crouch, I'm the founder of Washington Walks, and I'm with Mike Canning, who is the film critic for The Hill Rag, a um, monthly publication from the Capitol Hill neighborhood, but read throughout DC by people who like to know what's going on in a neighborhood and read Mike Canning's reviews. Mike's the author of a book called Hollywood on the Potomac, which inspired this webinar series about films that are very much DC centric, have good location shots in DC, and also say something to us about Washington DC or evoke Washington DC. And Mike, tonight's movie is really one of those films that is um, relaying so many aspects of official Washington um, in so many ways. Uh, politicians in the Senate, politicians in their hotel apartments, in their socializing, their poker game, and then in some cases deep, deep into their private lives and um, sometimes painful secrets that they have. Um, so how about I will uh, share my screen and shall we start by looking at the poster for this film? Sure. It came out in 1962. Here, Here we go. Briefcase or luggage the luggage tag has the capital with the dome. A character in the film talks about he's going to blow the dome off the capital in his in, with his impassioned speech on the floor of the Senate. Right. The, the uh, this poster combines two images that were used. The, there were many posters, and this was a uh, one that captured both the uh, guy coming to work in his uh, with his uh, satchel and the tag that shows the capital coming open, and not just being blown open, but being revealing all its secrets. Uh, the most common uh, logo used was the one with the capital opening up, revealing the secrets, which is the premise of the movie, as well as the novel. That's revealing uh, the, the backstory of, uh, of conniving and uh, um, ill good that, uh, that the novel uh, depicts. It was uh, the novel and the, and the film itself eventually are maybe the closest look in American entertainment at the Senate itself, one of the bodies of Congress. Uh, it has more detail. It uses the great set that was created for Mr. Smith goes to Washington. And it has a dialogue that's more believable and more intelligent regarding what actual senators do. It's still a fiction, it's made up, and it goes too far in some respects. It's mildly unbelievable at part, in part, but much of it is extremely uh, accurate and uh, a very important point in the, why I think it's so important in Washington movies is how much it really used the area in and around the Capitol and the city, which are featured all over the place. And we can uh, take questions about any of them if you want, but. Um, and I wish we had more clip material we could show, but the uh, the number of locations that are DC related that were actually shot here, right, amazing, and frankly has never been equaled since. I I'm I'm not at all surprised to hear that. I mean, let's just you and I can name some and folks who have maybe viewed the film. Although I will say it's a little hard to view this one compared to ones we've looked at so far because this one's not readily available online. Um, you can find clips about it on. Uh, the Turner Classic Movies website. I happen to own the DVD so I could watch it that way, but this isn't quite as easy as Mr. Smith 
or the day the earth stood still. But right. having said that, um, what I really love in terms of DC locations in this film is the ones, there's some sort of obscure ones that only a Washingtonian would recognize. Correct. One is right at the beginning and it is where Walter Pigeon's character lives. He plays a senator from Michigan, um, Senator Munson, and he lives in a building that senators really did live in. And in the film, they call it the Sheridan Park Hotel. But people familiar with DC, with the Woodley Park neighborhood, they will recognize it as today the Marriott Wardman Park Hotel. Except Senator Munson is living in the old building, what we maybe today think of as the original building. And doing something that senators did all the time in that day, um, instead of they'd rent a, a apartment essentially in a hotel. Correct. He's, by the way, in the film, he's a key player, a majority leader who is in charge of the nomination that drives the plot. But my favorite location is um, the one that has a glimpse of a bridge that connects the DuPont Circle neighborhood, Embassy Row, with Georgetown. And that is the Q Street Bridge, or sometimes called the Buffalo Bridge, because we get a glimpse oh, of one of the giant sculpted buffaloes that welcome you as you cross that bridge over the Rock Creek Parkway. And we follow a taxi cab that pulls up right in front of an apartment building on Q Street in Georgetown, where another character lives. And that building still exists today. It still has the same U-shaped driveway that an Uber today could go in and drop someone off. I think that's the home of, the, of Senator Brig uh, Anderson, as I remember. You know, I think it, actually, I think it's, it's Mr. Fletcher. It's his character lives in there. Oh, sorry, and who yeah. has an apartment also, not a house. Yeah. Whatever, there's locations all over the place. And they're used accurately, they're used, uh, they're used quite concretely. Right, well, you provided me with a still of here is Otto Preminger, the director, with Don Murray on the left. He plays uh, Senator Brig Anderson from Utah. And then we've got Charles Lawton, who plays Senator Sig Cooley of Sieb, South Carolina. Sieb. Oh, sorry, Seabright, Sieb, that's right. Seabright, he's Seabright. Seabright. Perfectly Only Senate. in the South, only in South Carolina, probably. Right. And then it. we have Walter Pigeon, and there they are. They are on location. They're on, yeah, Jefferson Drive. You can see the, mem the um, Grant Memorial and the White House were at the West Front. And the, I'm sorry, there's the Capitol behind them. Reflecting. How does, how does Otto Preminger get permission to film at the Capitol campus? Because in this sense, the, in this case, the characters are a little bit at a distance from the Capitol, but right. there are shots in this film where he clearly got permission to film inside the Capitol building. Absolutely, and all around, uh, including uh, the uh, Russell Building, which was the only Senate building at the time. Although the Dirksen, which you can also see in the film, was, it was built, it wasn't really occupied in 62. It took a little while later. But the fact is that um, he got access, uh, a touch of the rotunda. He's all over the place. Uh, he's in the crypt at one point. Um, there's, um, that's when the Secret Service guys are coming up to the... Oh, right, neighbor. yes, yes. Uh, okay. One thing I, I'll, I'll ask you to show, I know you, well, no, you couldn't show it, but I'll, tell, I'll walk up and tell you about it. Uh, a nice sequence which actually mir mirrors Mr. Smith uh, and several other things mirror Mr. Smith too. There's another sequence here, just as in Mr. Smith, where a character gives information about the nature of the Senate itself, mm -hmm. uh, a little briefing. Uh, and this is when uh, uh, the lead female character, Jean Tierney, uh, whose, whose career, career was resuscitated by this film, comes with a couple of friends, the, I think it's French mm -hmm. uh, ambassador's wife, yep. and the British ambassador's wife, and she's taking them to the chamber to introduce them to the business of the Senate. Fine. And it shows, the sequence opens, opens pardon me, I'm going to cough. <clears throat> it shows the, uh, a tour group, thank you very much, being taken through the Capitol and walking upstairs to the entry uh, uh, walkway where the visitors, the visitors walk where you can go in 
to the chamber. And it shows a, a real tour guide walking up with a group and the three ladies coming to do the same thing, to come in on the upper level. And they're welcomed by the door guy, whoever he is, and he says, welcome ladies, opens the door to the real uh, section of the chamber, and then cut, we're inside the chamber, and we're in Culver City, California, which is where the set of the chamber is, because they, again, just like with uh, Frank Capra earlier in Mr. Smith, they wouldn't let Otto shoot on the floor. Right. Nobody ever has. But it is very impressive. Indeed. And yeah. again, I think I made it obvious earlier, the set that they're using, a full model replica of the Senate. Yeah. It's the same one from Mr. Smith, dolled up and repainted and fixed up clean. But it's just perfect. I'm a little surprised that, and maybe, but maybe I shouldn't be, because maybe Otto Preminger's status was high enough that um, he was going to be granted permission to film in the Capitol, on the campus, and inside, uh, just because he was a well-known film director. However, this material, this book, is kind of controversial. It was hugely popular, but there are themes in the book, and even language in the book, that um, Otto Preminger was prepared to include, knowing it might get him in trouble with the censors in Hollywood. Yes, and he, he, after he became a mature and a renowned director, he was always in pushing the envelope to include stuff that was controversial. It became his uh, trademark. <clears throat> and he insisted on both uh, getting into the White House, which was Kennedy's White House by the time, by this time, and, and the Capitol, and he didn't even <clears throat> get approval for either. Although, as a full of himself, egocentric fellow, he thought he could, but he didn't make it. He didn't make it. He didn't make it. Let's, um, well, actually, here's another still. Senator Cooley, mm -hmm. um, and you wanted to see if anybody who's participating Please. knows where he's standing. He's on location. He's yep. not in Culver City. No. Nope. Does anyone where? recognize? Anybody guess where this is? Where this is. Where's he going? Here is someone who's raised their hand. Who knows where we, knows DC, okay? Lorna thinks she might know. Go ahead. Can you type it in, Lorna? Or actually here, you can tell us. If you know. Oh, here's someone, Chris oh, Jameson. It's the Treasury um, Department, the South Side. Yes. Bingo. That's, that's it. That's and Lorna. Washington across the street. <clears throat> yep. Yep. Lorna, that's Lorna. Thank you. You're on, right on the button. Yep. I just wanted to test people because it looks like a generic Washington building. And she's exactly right. It's uh, the South Side entry, which, by the way, not that many people, well, people don't go in there anymore. No. But, uh, he's going in to get some dirt on uh, a guy who uh, uh, he's, he's, he's trying to uh, include in, his, in the uh, hearing. And he ogles... Um a he's few women on his way. This is one of them. And then as he's going into the building, he also sort of up and downs a few women in a rather lecherous way that we don't want to think <laughs> A little bit. Uh, by, by the way, just an insider thing for people who uh, may, maybe don't know movies that well. This, by the way, is a still shot by a photographer hired on the shoot. Uh, it, is, it is not a frame from the movie. It wasn't taken from the film itself. This, uh, a guy was standing around as a photographer, shooting him coming into the plaza here and going into the building. But it's just a still, it's not from the uh, film strip itself. But uh, the ogling here, by the way, is more obvious than it is in the film, I think. Yes. Would all films, would all productions have a location photographer? Yeah, it's not, they're, they're not a location photo photographer so much as a stills photographer to put on posters and uh, what they used to do in old movies with a, the slide, the, um, cards to put up outside the theater in uh, okay. Class, okay. class cases, but they right. still do it all right. the time. Uh, and, and usually they, they don't match that perfectly. Um, we'll get to all the president's men down the line, right? Mm -hmm. Next week. There's, there's a good case there of, of a fine shot of uh, Redford and uh, Dustin Hoffman, which never appeared in the, in the film. It's a, good, it's a great shot, a great demonstration of what the film was about. 
Anyway, this is where he goes. And besides getting to the outside, Lawton went in to the, and was set up in a, in a modest office um, wow. and sat down with uh, an actress and, and chatted with him. Wow. And what I remember from that, because I was a government employee long enough, and in the 60s, that the placard that is outside the door is exactly the kind of blue placard with a, a blue section with a number and a little strip on the bottom that government agencies use for decades. Yeah, you see them in there, right? In the in that scene, yeah. Well, um, yeah, go ahead. Are there in the past two films that we've looked at, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington and The Day the Earth Stood Still, many instances where you explained the second unit came to Washington and filmed all these locations. And then back in California, the actors are, <clears throat> I'll say this isn't the right term, but superimposed. Oh, that's the right term, yeah. Okay, over this film. Any instances of that in this movie? I don't believe everybody there are. really in Washington. I, I think so. Um, and they had the two locations anyway. Um, I looked it up and uh, not only was this one of the best location shoots for Washington movies, it was one of the longest. Um, they shot in 1961 in DC from early October to the very end of November. So they, the, the, the crew and actors spent two months here. That's a very long shoot. It's, I can't think of one that matches it. Um, except, pardon me, Broadcast News, I think, was here the whole time. Hmm. They maybe uh, have a little longer one. So the entire film was shot in the Washington area. They didn't wow. go back for anything. Uh, but here they had to uh, go back for um, the scene, uh, the Senate uh, chamber, obviously. Right. Uh, everything else you see, for example, there, there were small scenes that um, nobody outside Washington would even know. Uh, one of the, uh, what's his name, Don Murray, has to go to New York to yes. find, hit, find out his, about his past. And he goes to National Airport and he goes to National Airport. There's no question about it. He goes up to He goes a, to beautiful Art Deco Terminal A. Yes. Yeah. And he gets his ticket there and yep. goes, runs to the plane and all that. It's all ready. It's all set. Yeah. Uh, and this he, character, Seed Cooley, he arrives to work um, by the um, Capitol on a DC streetcar. Yes, an electric streetcar. Yeah. And then cuts over right at um, uh, Constitution. And um, I guess it's first, is it? Would be first? Yeah, it must be about first. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, he, whereas there's now all barriers and stuff. Right. right, yeah, right, completely. And, and they both go into the main entrance of the Russell Building. He meets uh, Munson there. Yep. Well, and another thing, while we're talking about lesser known sites in DC, this is near the Capitol, but there is a scene when characters are in the background is the um, big granite or marble statue of General Meade. Correct. In the US Civil War. Mm -hmm. And the setting of that statue in 1962 is very different than um, its setting today. It's um, less uh the landscaping is really different um, you know what happened today in a, that, that's very it's very misleading in a way in fact when my wife and i uh, judy saw it recently um she said wait a minute they're on the mall how and they're sitting on the fence a bench there who the hell is that and i said that's mead because what's in the middle uh, what doesn't what doesn't you don't see anymore is the um east wing right the east wing covered all that up, that woodsy, whatever the hell it is. Yeah, it it's, part of yeah the it's not there anymore. But it's, it's long gone, it's totally it's gone. gone. Oh, here's another one. I love this one. Henry Fonda's character, he plays Senator Leffingwell, the person, the Senator who's trying to be confirmed as Secretary of State. Correct. He very conveniently lives like stones throw away from the Senate and from the Capitol in what people today, well, we would have traditionally called this the Sewell Belmont House. Right. Today, it's, it's, a, it's a historic house on the, at the intersection of um, Second Street and um, Constitution Avenue. Today, right. it's the Belmont Paul Women's, National Women's Equality Monument, yeah. dedicated to women's suffrage and the 19th Amendment. And it's great, Leffingwell's little boy, a young teenage boy rides his bike up, 
goes inside right mm -hmm. into, and in 1962, that still was going to be the headquarters building of the National Women's Party. <laughs> so that's neat. They got permission to film outside of there. And in that era, it's covered in ivy. And all of that has been cleared away. Right, they're not made of that. Absolutely. They have a very nice garden behind the wall there. Yeah, it, right. It just, it just uh, made me think of, of course, of several um, non-Washington sequences, uh, interiors that were done uh, in studio in uh, White Columbia, uh, including once they get inside the Sewell Belmont house, they're not in the Sewell Belmont house. No. They're in a, a stage set in, uh, in Washington. But nicely done. Yeah. Oh, sure. It's, it's uh, flawless. Mm -hmm. it's similarly, uh, in the when they're in the hotel offices and a couple of other places, some of the shots are in the hotel and uh, are in hotels when they're there. There's a sequence, uh, convincing one, where the president gives a speech to the Washington Press Association. Yeah. Um, and you know what? We can actually see a moment of that. Yeah. Let's look at the trailer. The trailer for this film is interesting because it sets up the film as an event, as an event that brings in press from around the world to be there on the first day of shooting for Otto Preminger. So I'm going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, sure. stop this. You can bring it up, great. And I will find my... Oops. Hold on here. Let's see where it went. Well, let's see, maybe I lost it. Sorry about that. No, here it is. <laughs> sure. All right, let me make this large so everyone can see it. This is going to give us a real nice um, feel for the tone and the cinematography and some of the themes that this story explores. The future of the world is being decided in two cities. Here's our set. One of them is Washington, D.C. There's that great set. Advise and consent. From the time this novel of Washington was first published, it held the number one spot on all of America's bestseller lists for more than 70 weeks during 1959 and 1960 creating unprecedented national interest. From all over the world, correspondents arrived to report on Otto Preminger's filming of a motion picture. Senators, political personalities, international diplomats, newspaper men, and members of the Advise and Consent Company at a party celebrating the start of production. Here in the heart of Washington, Otto Preminger films the Pulitzer Prize novel, Advise and Consent. It's a story of the men and women who live and work in Washington, their private feuds and public conflicts, which affect the lives of everyone, everywhere. To tell this story, Preminger's cameras move in where no motion picture cameras have ever been permitted. In the very room which saw the Kefauver crime investigation and the McCarthy hearings, Preminger stages another controversial inquiry. A word of warning, these people are all fictional, so don't try to guess who they are. Want to know what you intend to give away to the communists? I don't intend to give anything away, Senator Cooley. What do you know about him? He's a communist. Walter Pidgeon stars in the most important role of his career. You call that a deal? I call it extortion. Actual members of the White House Correspondents Association become actors to recreate their annual dinner for the President of the United States. Can you read this? The president hasn't changed his mind about his nominee one fraction of an inch. He's going to fight for that confirmation. Right of what? The blonde young man leading the applause is George Grizzard from the Broadway stage, starting a new career in films. What do you punk water politicians think the world's like? You want to get us bombed out of existence for some lousy two-bit country in Lower Slobovia that can't even feed itself?
Director Preminger's cameras board a warship in Chesapeake Bay to film a scene of political crisis. I don't know, Mr. President. But the last night I saw Brig Anderson, I saw a man in terrible pain. I wonder if Leffingwell or any one man is worth all of this. Gene Tierney returns to motion pictures as Washington's most talked about hostess. The setting for her lavish party is the famous estate of a former ambassador to Russia. Among the guests, you may recognize government officials and leaders of Washington society who play themselves. All sides of Washington life pass before the camera lens, from the hubbub of the social world to the suburban homes that appear so quiet from the outside. That awful creature on the telephone, he knows what he's talking about. He's not making something up. Now, something's going to happen if you don't do what he wants, and you've got to prepare me. He's a brig in his office. Cut his throat. You want rain? Yes, please. He doesn't live here, you know. Let me hear his voice. Speak his voice. A voice that will. He will pursue a policy of a peace. He will weaken the moral fiber of our great nation. Today, the future of the world is being decided in two cities. One of them is Washington, D.C. <laughs> And there was our Capitol Dome opening up. Correct. Mike, mm -hmm. um, they say in that trailer, these are only actors. Don't think that you can recognize who they are. Except that there were a lot of people that did speculate who these actors represented. Because yeah. Alan Drury's novel was really considered something of a room on a clef. Right that it was inspired by things that really happened. And I think in the trailer when they say, Preminger got to film in the room where these two hearings occurred, one of them being the um, very controversial um, <clears throat> McCarthy hearings, people have got to have thought, well, what's Alan Drury about with this story? And that, is that one reason that this film was so high profile? Perhaps uh, an interesting uh, element that uh, brings, brings us down to real life, uh, Drury was very delighted that his movie was going to be made. He, uh, he didn't have to cut it because it was a massive novel, about 700 pages, with lots of subplots and other figures who don't even, are not even important. In the, in the, they have to be cut from, from the uh, film. Uh, one thing he, de he denounced, because he was asked about it when it was a, uh, a novel, uh, he didn't denounce, he said, made, said it straight, is I did not pattern anybody in this film after a real person. They are all composites. They may contain grains of figures here and there and contemporary senators, but I did not calculatedly mean Leif Smith, played by uh, Peter Offord, to be John Kennedy. Mm -hmm. Well, that would make an interesting connection since they were familial. Uh, I didn't mean... Um, Lou or, or um, uh, French Atone to be FDR, mm -hmm. not my intention. And there's lots of other stuff like that. Things were in the air though, and right. uh, especially journalists and critics couldn't help naming uh, elements. One of, the, one of the most frequently cited is a uh, senator, um, blanking on his name, uh, who, um, commit, who committed suicide actually in 1954 because of a homosexual link in his family, not because he was, because a family member was, and an enemy of his was going to out his, his, his family members, I mean, two of them. 
and he that's was, yeah and that certainly is a a, a storyline here um and I think a backdrop for this film, 1962, novel 1961, uh, or 1960, um, that President Eisenhower, when he was in office, had signed an, ex an executive order um, basically forbidding people, I think the term was sexual perversion. Yes. Anyone involved or accused of that could not serve in the federal government. And it caused thousands of employees to resign, people not applying for fear of being outed. Um, so this, when you know that, the stakes for the character in this film, who is just, his life is destroyed because he's afraid that his identity as a gay person is gonna be revealed. Um, you understand the pressure that someone would have been mm -hmm. under at that time. The, the senator, I checked my, my source here, uh, who uh, killed himself uh, because of a potential uh, outing, was Lamar Hunt of Wyoming, and that was in 1954. But the, it was a horrendous story, and it lingered, obviously, in people's memories. So it was an obvious thing to link up. But uh, basically, I've learned not to give too much credence to, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting part of the game. Robert Byrd wrote about the film, for example, at length. He did a, a, a treatise about Hollywood movies that, that covered the Congress. And he kind of himself debunked it. Uh, he said, although he repeated it, in other words, what's the, which would right. <laughs> Yeah, because it's a good story. Right. But that wasn't well, Drury's intention. Right. But certainly the, you can see with the Jean Tierney character um, that she's clearly modeled on many a Georgetown hostess. Of course. We were arriving at this time, and this is this is actually the golden age of the Georgetown hostess, and the necessity for politicians and power brokers and even diplomats to be able to negotiate the Georgetown social scene, which was controlled by a group of powerful, intelligent, savvy, and often beautiful and charming women. Right. Um, and what's interesting in this film is that this particular the character Dolly, who Jean Tierney plays, she's doing this all as a widow. She's, she's doing this all as a single woman. And there's a scene that I just think is remarkable where she's hosting what looks like the weekly poker night for the senators. Yes, indeed. She's the only woman, it's at her house, it's her booze, uh, it's her food, and there they all show up. Correct. Yeah, it shows the party, uh, the, the clip showed a, a, the, the, the lavish party being filmed there. Uh, and that was shot at a, uh, the Tregoran house. It mentions it in the, in the narrative. Oh, really? Which was the, a house uh, occupied by um, Ambassador uh, Joseph Davies, who was- uh, Oh my goodness, great. Right. And so Tregoran, it still exists. It's in yeah. fact the home of the Washington International School. Correct. In Correct, yeah. So people here in DC will know that's the Cleveland Park neighborhood. And right. you would enter that estate um, by, if you're gonna, with your car, by Macomb Street. But then if you, um, you can also go on Klingle Road and, or Woodley Road and get to it through the beautiful right. Tregoran Conservancy, uh, because that estate had a large, it was an estate, had a lot of acreage. They has been preserved. Quite, it's still quite a grounds actually. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Another, I didn't realize that was Tregoran. Wow. Yeah. Another uh, cute story about that from an insider that was around when the thing was being shot. A lot of people were covering this movie because it was all over town for two months, as I said. Uh, what's his name? Preminger invited a bunch of folks. I don't know what his list was, but uh, Washington worthies. Uh, he wanted to get a, a good party crowd for that, for the backyard of that place, right. which he did. He rounded up uh, uh, a few hundred. Uh, and he he said to to be selected. You have to. You got there. They had nice studs on and stuff. It was very lavish. But to be selected, you had to, you had to pay the filmmakers twenty five bucks. Really? And they and they did. They, it was like attending a party that they had to pay for. They oh got in. God. So everybody had to pay twenty five bucks. But what they didn't get was booze, primitive oh. and booze. So nobody had any uh, liquor. It was all. Soft drinks and stuff. Bad. Yeah. Well, you know what? I did find that scene online. We should look at that because um, 
he there was a lot of people paying twenty five dollars. Oh yes, for them to shoot that scene. Okay, let me find it. Hold on. Okay. Now this clip I was able to find on Turner Classic Movies. Good. Uh, and you're gonna see this, and what I love about this, this is a really great example of an auto preminger tracking shot. We just follow different characters right. through the house, through the grounds. Sometimes we're in a big public event, then he just brings two characters together to have kind of an intimate conversation. Moving camera, no cuts. There he cuts. On the left, hint, Scoop Jackson. In some ways, he's excellent, but in others, not so excellent. In general, I would say we are for him, except when it comes to those features of character in which we might be disposed to be against him. On the whole, that is my government's position. Yes, exactly. Yes, the inscrutable East can always be dependent upon. Indian ambassador being very diplomatic. <laughs> you know your dance, darling? Senator, dance is beautiful. Your legs is not exactly the long term of the Senator is coming to lunch tomorrow. She'll be deeply honored, sir. She'll be our first guest at the embassy. Very kind. Bob, to you, man. You excuse me. Here comes Fred. Yeah. Good to see you at dinner, Fred. I just got here. But why didn't you take my call from New York, sir? I didn't want to take the call. I've been honest enough, Amsterdam. Reaching for Brig Anderson all the time, sir. No. We weren't reaching for you either. He's in the club, isn't he? What club? Tom, give me that. The inner circle, the clique, the club. Look, Fred, you forced me to offend you. I'm sorry. All right, I'm willing to forget it. I'll still campaign for Leffingwell. Fine, Fred. But that's not irritating the situation. But Robert Leffingwell is the difference between peace and war. I mean, to fight for it. Now I love this. We're, we're keeping going. Moving camera. Yep. No oh, cut. Being exclusive, Harley? Just escaping for a moment. From the this is the vice president played by uh, Lou Ayers. You mind if I ask you a question that a vice president shouldn't ask? You mean like, how's the president's help? I haven't seen him in six weeks. He never calls me in. I don't think he means to slight you, Harley. Probably he does, but that's not why I'm asking. Look, I know I'm only charming Harley in the housewife's delight. I know I was only a compromised candidate for vice president, and I wouldn't be here at all. I never expected to be president, and I hope to God I never will be, and I mean that. But the town's boiling with rumors about his health. If they're true, I should at least be told. All right. But this is just my own opinion. I don't think the surgery last year was successful. Well, I was once the happy governor of Delaware, counting revenue from corporate setups and having tea with the departments. Now... It hasn't happened yet, and maybe it won't. Bob, I'm not sure I've got the stuff to be president. Has anybody? Most presidents have to grow up in the job anyway. The country could go to hell before I'd grow big enough to see over the desk. Humility is not the worst attitude you could have toward this job. It's a nice word for the shakes, humility. In any case, you're the only vice president we have, so the Constitution says. 
You're the only vice president we have. Mm -hmm. I think even in that clip, we see something I really noticed in this film when I watched it again. And that is how lonely it can be to live in official Washington. Time and time again, characters like the vice president and even the George Grizzard character who's feeling frustrated because he's not being led into what he perceives as some kind of a clique or a club. If you're not privy to information, if you're not in with the right people, your life in Washington is miserable. And then if you have um, a secret about your life, like the Burgess Meredith character has a mental health issue and the Brig Anderson character has um, his gay relationship when he was in um, the military. It's excruciating to exist in official Washington. Now, this is 1962, and I'm not sure that has changed a bit since that time. I, I don't know. I mean, just to do uh, celebrity spotting, but I, I shouted out in the middle of that clip that uh, a real senator, a very young one at the time, was Henry Jackson in one of the shots uh, over on the left side. When yeah, Terry, she asked him if he wanted a drink. Right, and he yeah. said, coming yeah. into the house. Um, there were a couple of other at the scene. I don't know if they made the final cut. Um, and actually, again, seeing it, the, the uh, majority leader coming down to talk with uh, uh, Harley, Hudson, uh, Harley Hudson, the Lou Ayres character, does ring true. You can understand why people uh, thought or attributed the vice president's character to Vice President Harry Truman, who was uh, around when his president was dying although Truman knew almost nothing about it. Uh, and his president, uh, French Aton, would be linked with uh, Roosevelt. Right. But that, that wasn't really a coincidence, maybe, or just lingering in the subconscious of uh, the writer. Well, Alan Drury gives the vice president character, we won't want to give anything away for people who haven't seen the film yet, but um, his character goes on quite a, a good journey in this film. He's oh, yeah. not the same man sitting at that table with Walter Pigeon as he is at the end of the film. Yeah. You know, another thing, Mike, in this film, we talked a little bit about um, how difficult life is portrayed for someone who's gay in official Washington. I mean, that straits are so desperate that the person um, you know, takes his life. Mm -hmm. Another theme that would have been very resonant with people in the early 1960s was the theme of communism and yes. the danger of communism. And that is um, what Henry Fonda's character, that's a charge that's leveled at him, that he in his younger days was part of a communist cell in Chicago. To, uh, in fact, you've combined the, uh, both Drury himself and uh, uh, Preminger went for the sh uh, pr because he was Mr. Controversy, especially at that time. And he had a pretty good leeway. So he was delighted, and this may seem very dated to people now, he had the, the twin bugaboos of 1960, namely the commies, and they're coming to get us, and uh, the gay people, homosexuality as a threat to our way of life and culture. So those were the two dilemmas that in fact uh, drove much of the drama uh, and very scandalous at the time, uh, yeah. especially in a, in a major motion picture, right? Um, especially from a major studio. So something that they wouldn't have otherwise touched. But Preminger got it made and got his, got his script uh, qualified. It was actually accepted. There's a, there was a, uh, the National uh, Review Board for the, uh, from Hollywood to look at scripts and give them a, an okay. Uh, and so they could have significant distribution from the studio. And uh, Preminger cut enough corners, made enough changes to, to uh, massage the script. So it was in fact fully accepted, although it was criticized afterwards. Oh, it was. Yes, it was. How, how was this film received when it premiered? Pretty good. Um, the reviews were basically positive with a few real stinker. Um, so major reviewers, uh, many major reviewers or mid-level reviewers liked it fine and thought it was a really good depiction of Washington. Two biggies uh, later, Pauline Kael and, and Bosley Crowther, who was the most important critic at the time at the New York Times, 
both thought both thought it was wanting. Kale clobbered it. Um, as yeah. She was not a famous uh, writer on the East Coast by then. She was still living in San Francisco. She thought it was a stinker. Um, but other, it had a pretty good uh, reception. I don't know how well it did overseas. There were many people who appeared in this book. Well, not many, but some folks in this cast, this was their last film that they appeared or, in. Or late. Late is significant. Now, one died right afterwards, and that was Charles Lawton. Right. Right. He just lived about six months later, and I guess he saw a final print. I hope he did. Um, and he died. Uh, he, he, he was in very bad shape when he died. He was an Alzheimer's patient, so maybe he didn't see anything. But he shot it the year before, and he was okay doing it then. Uh, other characters were kind of brought, uh, Jean Tierney was brought back from a seven year hiatus. Right. She was the biggest star of 20th Century Fox by far, and was, uh, was fading and was very sick, had a terrible relationship with her hus husband, designer. Morgan Cassini. Uh, she was post, uh, what do you call it? Uh, post, no. I'm, I'm missing the word. Medically disturbed. Had to be institutionalized for a while. Wow. She, she only made, it wasn't the end of her career, but it was the fade. She made one more feature of any significance two years later. And then uh, for the rest of her working life into the 80s, she made only t TV appearances. Hmm. Similar with Lou Ayers, who became a TV stable. Stable. He, he's the kind of guy who appeared in uh, Angela Lansbury stuff in the seventies and eighties. Mm -hmm. They were friends, uh, but he didn't make any significant movie after um, about sixty-five. How about Walter Pitchin? What happens with his career? Some people say this is him at his best. I think the trailer. Uh, is this. One of his best, absolutely. Yeah, he was much. He was a big star with MGM uh, for a long time. Uh, but his career aged nicely. He, he cooked into the, he, he made movies into the 80s, but they were, he was still a, a regular, a solid character actor. Um, now someone, t speaking of TV. Oh, and also, um, <laughs> Go ahead. another big star, one other big star uh, people may not remember, was Fran Chaton, who was a, yeah. a longtime actor for um, uh, MGM and Fox, uh, and he started in the early 30s, was a big star in the 30s, actually, famous. And then, the, and then he petered out and he became, again, one of those extras in TV. I think I remember he died, well, he died six years after making this right. film. 68. Yeah. But when you talked about TV and Angela Lansbury, that reminded me that of someone who becomes really big on TV has a cameo in this film. And she plays a senator. And I'm really pleased that Otto Preminger depicts what, by my count, there were two female senators, and maybe there really were at that time, but mm -hmm. one of them. Only one. Only Mark one. Smith. So it's Betty White. Yeah. She has this great cameo where she can deliver a bit of a zinger to yeah. George Rizard's character on the Senate floor, and you really can see the Betty White of. Um, Everything she went on to do in comedy after that. She's, almost, she's so young. I know. It's not necessarily recognizable to people. Well, her voice. Her voice I is recognized just, her voice. And then I looked again and I realized, oh my gosh, it's Betty White. Another nice uh, trivia point about casting. Preminger, a very uh, a liberal Austrian who, who got the hell out of uh, Europe way before Hitler. No, just after Hitler, actually, but coincidentally, and came to Hollywood, never left. Um, he wanted very much Martin Luther King Jr. to appear in the film. Wow. And it approached him and they talked and their, their, their people talked. Their, my people talked to your people. And King finally backed off. He was interested, but he backed off because he said he wasn't sure his appearance in this picture, which was controversial and full of bad senators, or yeah, politicians who were not very attractive, that it would affect his followers. He wanted to appear pure and clean and, and uh, dignified. And so you, stuff. How did Otto Preminger want to use him? Because in the film, interestingly, there, there seems to be depicted a senator from Hawaii who right. is a person of color. Otherwise, any person of color in this film is the help. Um, right. No, no, you see no politicians who are uh, African-American. That, that was still the case. 
I forgot to um, research whether, but I don't think uh, uh, the, the first black senator, Edward Brooke from Massachusetts, I don't think he was a senator at this time. He may have been in Congress, but I don't think he was a senator. So he would, that would have been one example. Uh, example. No, but, but Preminger wanted King because he would be a draw. He was hot. This is one of the, one of the key points of his fame, he, right before the Washington speech. Mm -hmm. um, and he was, a, he was a very much a liberal. He was a liberal progressive at all times. Um, would he have wanted King to play himself? No, 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 I don't think so. He would have been, a, no, he would have been a made up character. They would have written this uh, a line. And I don't, it wouldn't have been a character. It probably, it would be on a cameo like Betty White. And we'd stand up in the chamber and say something. Wow. It would have been recognizable to uh, the audience. If people are um, intrigued by this film or they kind of admire it, what other Otto Preminger films would you recommend people seeking out? Well, Probably his, well, his, his breakout film, well, he, he made films from the 30s on, uh, and he was with um, Fox for almost all that time, and he was contracted. Then he became independent, by the way. He was an independent producer when he made this film. Um, he, his breakthrough film was with uh, Gene Tierney, whom he used several times, was Laura from 1944. Yeah. A great film noir or detective yeah. story yeah. Uh, of its day, uh, a big hit. It was a, it was a modest script. It wasn't heavily financed, and it had a great trouble finding a villain uh, that Preminger insisted on Clifton Webb, and that's what had made the film, actually. Um, actually, the, he had, the, the studio wanted somebody else, but there was so obviously a villain, a villainous character, uh, a guy named Laird Krieger, who's been totally forgotten, but he was a 20th Century Fox player. But they got Webb, and it made the film that much more effective, his slimy, Right. Waldo Lidecker, one of the great Washington. He, he made a famous film of, of the time based on a very famous novel called Forever Amber. That was a couple of years later with another one of his leading ladies, Linda Darnell. Um, he, um, he, he made uh, a couple of other blockbusters around this time. Right before this uh, was Exodus, based on a um, famously yeah. successful novel. Right. And just after this was in 63, he released The Cardinal, which is another famous um, book about the Vatican uh, with Tom Tryon and a few others lingering out into, the, into his career. But he, he, he did a lot of, he had a really mixed career, made all kinds of movies. Uh, I just thought of the 50s too, where he got, uh, with MGM, he made uh, Hollywood versions of uh, Porgy and Bess and uh, the opera Carmen called Carmen Jones with a whole black cast. Oh, right, sure, yeah. He, he was. He, he made two movies with all black casts. He was Hollywood progressive. You know, someone we didn't mention. Oh, yeah. You know what? Anatomy of a Murder. Of course. So was realizing that, yeah, that's right. That's a movie too. One of his again, based on a very popular novel. He loved popular novels and, and to, get, to get them adapted. Wasn't a screenwriter himself so much, although he played with the with the language. We did not talk about Henry Fonda who not played Senator Leffingwell, he doesn't have, he has an important part, but he really isn't in the last third of the film. Where does, okay. where does advice and consent come in his career? Um, um, middle, because his career lasted from the mid thirties, effectively. Um, I mean, from the beginning, he was in, important in films. And then uh, 1980, he made On Golden Pond, which was uh, 20 years later. And then that was it, it faded. He was very ill by then. Uh, this was right, kind of in the middle, but it was in the mature, serious Fonda phase. He, by the way, he started as a kind of a dippy, uh, naive comedian, comedian with Robert Stanwyck and others. Then he became iconic with uh, Grapes of Wrath and Young Mr. Lincoln. Right. Uh, but here he was in a, he was the, um, a, a sort of a national icon, right. political icon and made films like this one and he played the president in uh, fail safe two years later right a fine performance based on a um, television play and uh he was also he also played as another candidate for president in the best man in 1964 uh from that's story vidal right Vidal's text yeah it was a broadway play and Shorn Fine, elegantly dressed, perfectly suited, uh, with a um, either no wife or a wife who isn't quite with him. Um, 
but a, but a decent guy who has a flaw and mm -hmm. uh, tries to get past it. Mm -hmm. But uh, not quite revered, but seen as uh, a man uh, upright, I would call it. That's what he played from the 50s into the uh, middle 60s. He played a couple of nasty villains in his later years. Now, someone is who is participating is reminding us that um, Otto Preminger also directed Man with a Golden Arm, which he wrote screenplay. And then this is this may be the fun fact of the evening. He played the villain, Mr. Freeze, in the Batman TV show. Correct. <laughs> that for, for a couple of excellent. And if you want to see him acting, if we're doing Otto still. Um, he didn't direct, but he appeared as a Nazi colonel in uh, Stalag 17 from 93 by Billy Wilde. And it, with his, he has an amazing Teutonic accent, which he never lost. Not only wasn't it a German, he was an Austrian. And he plays this uh, vigorous and smart colonel of a uh, camp, prison camp for Americans. I know that this film is talked about in your book and you have this as one of your top in your top 10 Washington DC films, right? Absolutely. What, what, what to you makes this, how does this get into your top list of Washington DC films? Well, it's kind of two criteria that you mentioned about in last time. One is how, how a script and a film treats Washington as a subject and whether they do it with uh, either humor or drama uh, they get into Washington to some respect. And my other sort of basic criteria is physical locations and how much they are actually, how much Washington is actually used, uh, as I say, used as a character in the film. And this is 100% in both elements. It's the world of the Senate depicted as never before uh, and with Washington locations that are very fine and very consistent with few goofs. There are a few, uh, right. but they're minor. I could do it, that's for another time. Is one goof, we get to see the um, underground sort of subway. The monorail. That really does exist, the monorail inside underneath the Capitol that goes between the two wings of the Congress. Are they really riding on that, the real one in the film? Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. No, that's absolutely legit. So all the locations that you see, there's mm -hmm. no, significant location, even believe this, um, they got into the Russell buildings, uh, the, the only Senate building at the time, into their cafeteria. Where they I, I wondered about that when I saw the- That's, yeah. not, a, wow. that's not a set. Wow. And when, and when Brig Anderson goes into the Russell building to go to his office upstairs, runs upstairs, yeah, that's a real office. It looked like it, and the stairway he goes up looks so much like it the real thing. It absolutely thing. is. They wow. They didn't fudge. Wow. That's impressive. Well, people can read more about this and other films that we're talking about in this series in your book, Hollywood on the Potomac. I just put up on the screen how you can order it clicking away by Amazon, or you can contact Mike directly, and he can mail you um, a book, which he'll have signed for you. I'll be happy to do it. You have two choices. I also want to put up so people can see what we are going to be talking about next week. Um, it just gets better and better, Mike. <laughs> really, this what a wonderful way to spend a Wednesday night. Next Wednesday at noon, um, a Washington Walks guide, Martin Murray, is going to talk about um, how he has been involved from the get-go to document and preserve and tell the story of LGBTQ history in Washington, DC. And that next Wednesday night, we're gonna talk about all the president's men. Um, I think you and I both think this is, this is the movie about investigative journalism that happens to be set in Washington, DC. And you just said, when we were talking about this before we went live, uses Washington, DC brilliantly. Yes. Lots of good locations. If, of my top 10, which you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Uh, when people ask me, which they do all the time, what's my favorite Washington movie? I think it's All the President's Men. Is that, is it, is it? Wow. It's, all right. It's so, it's so good in so many ways. It is. I can't wait to see it again. I'm really. <laughs> to see it again. Well, we'll definitely see it again. <laughs> yeah, we'll see it again. I almost, always notice, I almost always notice something new. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much. This, these hours go by quickly. Um, I do. Thank you for your insights. And um, boy, the MLK piece of info, that was a really good one. Um, yeah. And thanks to you all for um, joining this webinar. And we'll hope to see you again next week at another one. Good night. Oh, I'm getting some nice thank yous. Thank you. Good. Thanks, folks. Thanks for attending. Yes, thank you very much for attending. See you again. Bye-bye.